Well, thank you all for uh, having me. Thank you all for uh, inviting an eagle to come mingle with you uh, prestigious Aggies today. When uh, Rosalind called me, I've known Rosalind since freshman year, since I was a freshman at North Carolina Central University. Since I was a freshman at North Carolina Central University. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you how long ago that was, but whenever she calls, um, since I was a freshman, I've always jumped at whatever she says. So when she invited me to do this, I was eager to do it. And I was eager to do it because uh, Jelani favors. Jelani is one of my favorite authors, great brother. And it's a pleasure for me to be able to uh, sit down with him to talk about his wonderful book. And as you can see, I have two copies of it. I have a paperback and I have a hard copy behind me. So uh, whenever I get a chance, I'm reading his work. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So Jelani, how are you feeling today? How's, it, how's everything going? It's good, man. Everything is great. And it's, it's good to be back with you to touch mics once again. Ernie and I actually had this uh, a similar conversation for the uh, Jimmy Carter Presidential Center here in Atlanta. I guess it was back in November. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Was that before or after the election? That was uh, before. Okay, election. before the election. Okay, okay. So I always like when I when I start these things, I always like to make sure that everybody's is doing well mentally with this, the way the world is. We're approaching a year of COVID. So how are you doing? How are you holding up? How are you surviving? We're doing great, man. Um, you know, I think I may have mentioned this to, to the folks at the Jimmy Carter Center, maybe to you, but uh, first of all, prayers go out to everybody who's been affected personally by this pandemic. Uh, in October, my mother um, was diagnosed and spent about three weeks in the hospital and it was touch and go for a while. So we were really nervous, but thankfully she came through. But, uh, you know, we realized that there are a lot of folks who don't have that same story. So um, mm -hmm. peace and blessings um, to any of you if you've had some um, direct contact from COVID um, and, you know, like everybody else, we're just trying to trying to get through this in one piece. So, uh, yeah. but things are, are well, and, you know, we're, my wife and I are here homeschooling a, a daughter and, and she's doing well and um, life is good, man. Life is good. Okay. Good. Well, you're looking good. I like that sweater. Yeah, thank you, brother. Well, you know, we got to represent. <laughs> All right. So, Ernie, we're going to work to get him one of these. I got my little pen here, so <laughs> I don't want to blind you guys too much. <laughs> right, right. So we're going to let's, let's we're going to have like a broad uh, conversation. And, and as Tina said, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. But I want to start off February one. That's that's kind of you know a holiday at North Carolina. I mean North Carolina A and T's campus and in Greensboro, and and it's a significant date in the history of this country. I don't want to uh, downplay that. Tell me about, and we're going to get into your origin story a little bit, but tell me about you walking onto that campus for the first time, looking at that statue, what that meant. And, and we're going to talk later about how that relates to your scholarship. But just what does that statue, what does this date mean to you? Well, the statue wasn't up when I was there. So, oh, okay. <laughs> but but, uh, but you, you could feel that shadow and that presence cast all across that campus. You know, February 1, um, you know, I was going to say to the folks here, maybe we should get a petition going. You know, I don't know if we have an Aggie Pride Day, but, you know, this is it. I mean, th this is an Aggie holiday and, and it should be celebrated as such. Um, when you think about what this date means uh, and more specifically about what that event meant um, for America and for the civil rights movement, um, this, is, this is the embodiment of Aggie Pride. Uh, if there's one day out the year where Aggies can stick out their chest and say, had it not been for some Aggies, right? You know, where would we be? Uh, this is that day. And so, uh, you know, when I arrived on campus, that's the thing about, you know, people often say Aggie born, Aggie bred. When I die, I'll be Aggie dead. I was Aggie born. My, both my mother and my father uh, were Aggies. Uh, and so, uh, and, I, and I'm gonna share this now. And I, you know, I'm not sure if I shared this with you in our last conversation, Ernie, <laughs> and I hope people don't cut off their cameras when I say this. But, you know, I went to North Carolina Central my freshman year. I'm you sorry. Probably, you probably so, should have stayed. <laughs> I, you know, I was trying to be the black sheep of the family. I wanted to get away because my mother had went to a &T, my father had went to a &T, my brother went to a &T, and I just wanted to do something different. Uh, and so I went to Central my freshman year in college, uh, and my father passed away my freshman year in college, and I transferred to a &T to be a little close to my mom, who at that time was living um, in, in Winston-Salem. Um, and you know, when I arrived, and this is, you know, my story is just similar to, to a lot of other folks. When I arrived on campus at AT, um, I was fully embraced. Um, you know, this was a, a very tragic moment, a crossroads in my life. And, you know, as I say, and I'm sure many of you often say as well, I had professors who believed in me at times when I didn't believe in myself. And that made the entire difference in my trajectory as a student. 
uh, at AAT, but all, not just as a student, but as a young man. Um, so I had people who were sewing into me, uh, who, who gave me full confidence in my intellectual abilities. And that provided the platform for me to, to move forward into grad school. And so, you know, when I arrived on campus, I knew exactly what I was getting into. Because again, AT in my family runs long and it runs deep. And so, you know, as a kid, I had gone to AT homecomings and, you know, gone to, to AT events across campus. So, AT was not a, 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 a stranger to me in my life. Uh, but it, it came to me in my life at a very crucial moment. And so, uh, again, Aggie born, Aggie bred, and when I die, I'll be Aggie dead. I can say that um, with all truth. Uh, and uh, so now I'm just working on trying to trying to get my daughter there, but my <laughs> wife is a Hamptonian, and we, we have constant arguments about that. So Okay, okay. <laughs> so when you, were at, when you were at A&T, did you know you wanted to be a writer and a professor, college professor? Uh, it was law school or, or writing for me, um, okay. you know, or... or uh, being a professor for me. Uh, the, the crazy thing about it is my father was a history major okay. uh, and my brother <laughs> was a history major. And so when I got on campus, history and, and engaging in intellectual thought and critical thought is, is what I did well. You know, shout out to, to, to the STEM fields and engineering and the College of Business. Those were all really hot areas on campus, but it was Gibbs for me all, all day, every day. You know, Gibbs uh, and, and the faculty in the history department and political science, um, those folks welcomed me with with open arms, and so um, you know that that's what I wanted to do. And and there was you know by the time I got to grad school, I went to grad school Ohio State, as you heard, and and I uh, did the master's program in African American studies. And I wasn't sure at that point whether I wanted to go to law school or, or go to the PA, go for the PhD. And I decided I wanted to become a public intellectual and to uh, to write. And so for me, that was was going to the PhD program. Okay. Okay. So you were, I mean, you're going to write a million books before you're, before you're done. You're going, write, you're going to write a lot of books. Did you think, you know, and I think I read in one, I read somewhere that you were encouraged to write about activism at HBCUs when you were at Ohio State. Right. Um, who encouraged you to do that? And did you think that that was where your scholarship was going to take you? Well, ironically, when I got to campus at Ante. I, that talking about student movement and student activism was the last thing I wanted to do because we talk about it a lot at a t we you know in the history program you know again it's the a t four we talk about the sit-ins we talk about the legacy of that institution and so when I arrived on campus at Ohio State I wanted to go into a different direction but it was one of my um, graduate professors Dr. William Nelson Jr. who has now passed on um, he was the one who encouraged me to take a deeper look um, into um, student activism, and more specifically in the HBCUs, he was encouraging me saying, look, this is really kind of a, a virgin territory, which is really hard for me to believe because of the legacy of, of Black colleges. But um, so so he was the one who really kind of pushed me into that direction. And and lo and behold, you know, as I began to do the research, he was right. This really was kind of virgin territory. There really hadn't been um, any um, book length treatments of HBCUs. Um, in terms of a depth uh, and a dearth of, of studies. So uh, I knew that I was onto something. In fact, I, I did my, my uh, master's thesis uh, on, the, on, on the Greensboro uh, generation that emerged there. And I had opportunity to interview Ezell Blair Jr. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, who go, of course goes by the name Jabril Kazan now. And I remember, I'll never forget, Jabril Kazan told me, because I'm interviewing him, he said, you know, look, you know, when we were kids, and I'm paraphrasing here, but this quote is actually in the book. But he says, you know, when we were students, um, you know, when I, I say students, I mean, when he was students in, in elementary school, in, in middle school, when we were students, we had teachers essentially telling us that we were going to be the leaders of, of freedom, that we were going to, it was, it was our generation who's going to move and forward and, and to take Black folks to, to higher heights and to, to deal with this great American paradox of, of white supremacy and Jim Crow. And then he said something that knocked me out of my seat. He said, that was before Dr. King came along. That's before Rosa Parks came along. That's what I was taught in my segregated school system in, 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 uh, in Greensboro. And, and that's, that's a direct quote, the last part. And, and again, you know, when you're a young writer, young scholar, and you're interviewing major revolutionary figures like Jabril Kazan. And then he says something like that, because I knew from having read so many materials uh, at that point that no one had ever talked about really who those teachers were, mm -hmm. right? You know, so I want, so immediately the question, you know, came up in my mind, well, who was teaching, <laughs> who was teaching uh, 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 Jabril Kazan, right? You know, he's saying that he had teachers sowing those seeds and that really wasn't a conversation that had really been fully had. Because uh, of course the next step is, 
finding out that all mostly all those teachers were trained to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a conversation that really had not uh, fully taken place within academia. And I knew that that's, that's a, a, a missing page that I wanted to fill in. And isn't that kind of basically the philosophy, well, I don't think he started it, but W.E.B. Du Bois about the talent and intent. That right. the percent of us would lead the 90% the of us. Right, yeah, I mean, and, and Du Bois, and, and Du Bois of course later moved off of promoting the talent and intent because he felt like the talent and intent that let, let Black America down at various points. They, you know, young Black folks, young academics, young college students were too preoccupied with partying and 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 and, and, and uh, all the type of other uh, um, uh, uh, frivolous things. And that was in the 30s. He, he was saying stuff like that. So so that that's what I always say to young folks: don't worry about people saying, "Hey, you you're unfocused." Black folks have been saying that you know, for, for generations, but Du Bois was very much concerned. He, not only that, but he believed in the power of educated black folks and particularly educated black folks who had had some type of exposure to the humanities and social sciences. And so, uh, and, and, and black colleges provided that type of exposure. So you're right, you know, certainly HBCUs became a haven and not just a haven, but also a, a, a incubator. Um, for Talented Tenth, but not just, again, Talented Tenth who were concerned about themselves. There were Talented Tenth young Black people who were concerned about the future of Black America and who saw themselves as cultural change agents because of what they had been exposed to at HBCUs. Okay. So I want to get back to something you said. So 1837, the Institute for Colored Youth starts, uh, which sets the foundation for what we have today with historically Black colleges. And you talked about how... Um, well, we haven't talked about how HBCUs have built the middle class, the black middle class. Well, you talked about your advisor at Ohio State said that this is a, this is something that hasn't really been tapped into um, on a scholarly basis. I know when I did my, my series in 1996, there had never been a newspaper in the whole country who had done as much work as I had done chronicling historically black colleges. So when you started doing your research, and we're going to get into some of that as well, why do you think that black colleges as rich as this history is, why do you think that black colleges have been so understudied and under um, evaluated or understudied as an academic field? Right, so, you know, there had been a couple of studies that had examined HBCUs, but they looked at them from a very episodic, very mm -hmm. narrow lens, right? Um, so there have been scholars who had talked about colorism on black college campuses and paternalism on black college camps, campuses and elitism on black college campuses. But none of that, and again, these are all realities that, that indeed define some of the experiences for black folks attending HBCUs, especially going back to the late 19th into the early and mid 20th century. Um, colorism was a real thing. Paternalism and elitism was a real thing. Um, but none of that ever explained how we got someone like Ella Baker. How do we get someone like Stokely Carmichael? How do we get someone like a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or a John Lewis or a Diane Nash? If indeed HBCUs um, were this sort of conservative bastion of, of, of elitism, um, then how do we produce these activists and these leaders? And again, that's what really had not been fully answered. Um, you know, I took a class at Ohio State called The History of Black Education. It was transformative, very powerful course that I took. Um, and it was in that class that I read a book called, uh, written by a professor by the name of William Watkins, uh, who, who wrote a book called The Architects of White of Black Education, The White Architects of Black Education. And just reading the title alone, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, The White Architects of Black Education, as if HBCUs and, and Black educators and teachers who work at these institutions did not have some sense of agency, right? But in that book, he goes on to say that, that Black colleges produced Black folks and Black students who um, were uh, uh, conformist, um, who uh, did not speak out, uh, who essentially were tools of a white supremacist system. Mm -hmm. and, and that class, probably more than any other course I ever took, left me with the feeling that, okay, you know what, somebody needs to correct this. Someone needs to, to really kind of tell the story of what these institutions truly represented. Uh, and, and so that's that's my path toward, towards writing that, and that book um, certainly uh, the art, white architects of black education that is certainly um, framed in my mind the fact that a, a number of scholars have really gotten that story wrong. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you, you ran down a list of people like Diane Nash and Martin Luther King, and you asked the question, how were they produced? How were, where did they come from? I mean, where, 
did this activist mind come from on these black campuses? Well, the great thing about it is, you know, these students came from all walks of life, right? You know, so if you're someone like, like Diane Nash, who's going to Fisk, or, or, or a, uh, a Martin Luther King Jr. who's going to Morehouse, those institutions have a different kind of ilk and a different type of vibe to them because they cater to the black elite, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to a school like Alcorn, or if you're going to a school like North Carolina A&T, um, these were institutions which often catered to and were the home for, of the black blue collar, uh, 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 working class folks sent their kids to schools at these institutions. Greensboro was a mill town. Right, you know, and not only that, so you had folks coming who were the sons and daughters of, of folks who worked in the mills and sons and daughters of folks who worked as, as sharecroppers down east in, in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and so those are the type of students who arrived at the, at, in these type of spaces. But one of the things that I, I attempt to do in my book is talk about how these spaces were similar um, moving forward. So whether it's the Institute for Colored Youth in 1837, or whether it's Alabama State University in the 1940s and 1950s, or whether it's North Carolina a t State University in the 60s and 70s, there's a similar thread that connects these institutions. And I, I make the argument that that thread is something that I um, come up with in a book called the second curriculum. Mm -hmm. right? And so at these institutions, Black students are being exposed to essentially three basic um, 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 issues and topics. One is race consciousness, the other is idealism, and the other is a sense of cultural nationalism. That space was radically different from what UNC Chapel Hill was offering. It was radically different from what Duke was offering. It was radically different from what all these other PWIs were offering. Black colleges provided a very unique space that served really as a counter narrative to white supremacy. Because again, you can imagine 1837, right, when the Institute for Colored Youth opens up, Black folks are still enslaved. Black folks in the North are fighting to remain free. Um, you have minstrel shows which are emerging uh, in, in the North in the 1830s and 1840s, which are, 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 are pushing out images of Black folks as sambos and jigaboos and lazy and coons, right? And so what HBCUs do is that they become, as I argue, a shelter in a time mm -hmm. of storm. Mm -hmm. where you can actually expose Black young folks to a counter narrative, a very powerful counter narrative. So race consciousness becomes a part of that, right? And as we celebrate Black History Month, and I made this post today on, on Instagram, one of the reasons why someone like um, Carter G. Woodson was so successful is that he leaned upon Black colleges and Black teachers to help him promote what they used to call Negro History Week, right? And mm -hmm. so it's Black teachers and educators who are promoting and pushing that message of, of race consciousness. The same teachers and educators who laid their hands on, spiritually, someone like an Ezell Blair Jr. And remember, Ezell Blair Jr. said, hey, it was my teachers, right, mm -hmm. who, who told me. That, that I was going to be somebody and that and that idea of being somebody is connected to helping my people get free right and so again you have teachers who have been exposed to this this long history of race consciousness race consciousness emerging from these institutions uh, and then you have idealism right uh, and when I say idealism you know two of the concepts that come up came up over and over again in the primary sources that I was using which was largely black student newspapers by the way um, two of the concepts that came up over and over again were citizenship and democracy. Mm -hmm. Citizenship and democracy. I mean, students were being drilled in these ideas, constantly be talking about citizenship and democracy, which always struck me as odd because citizenship and democracy was two, two of the things that Black folks were being denied every day. Right? And so, but yet these students have been exposed to the I ideals of citizenship and democracy and why they are important. And then the last one is the idea of cultural nationalism. Right? These young Black folks were being taught and, and really kind of drilled in this message that Black institutions matter, um, that supporting Black businesses matter. Um, these were young men and women who, who proudly called themselves race men and race women and, and, and knew, going back to your point about the town to 10th, that it was their job to, to, to uplift the race. And so those three concepts, cultural nationalism, idealism, race consciousness, that was found at a Hampton, that was found at a Howard, that was found at a Fisk, but it was also found at an Alabama State and a Southern University and a Grambling and North Carolina a &T. So that was the thread that really connected these institutions that allowed me to really take seven different institutions and tell their stories, but also understand why these institutions were very similar. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna get into the book first in a second, but I think I asked you this question at the Carter Center. Growing up in Winston-Salem, I grew up in Rocky Mount, you know, we grew up 
around colleges. You know, we knew colleges from the time we were in, in kindergarten because of basically Atlantic Coast Conference basketball. So we knew colleges all, all along. Plus the fact that I think when we were in school, there were probably 12 HBCUs in North Carolina, active HBCUs in North Carolina. So did you always know your parents did go to um, A&T and you went to Central, which was a great decision initially for you. <laughs> did you always know that you were gonna to go to an HBCU or were you gonna to go to Carolina or Duke or State? Or Aggie born, Aggie bred. I, <laughs> I, I never questioned it from the jump. You know, my, my father uh, was born and raised in Athens, Georgia. Okay, uh, all right. He, he came to a and uh, on a football scholarship. Okay. Um, he was recruited. So my father played football in the late 1960s at North Carolina A&T State University. Uh, so I said, as I said before, you know, going to homecomings, going to a and went to Salem State games. I mean, that was, that was life for us in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only that, not just football, but, you know, as I said before, my father went on to, to go to law school at North Carolina Central University. Okay. Uh, my mother had also attended a and uh, both of them became very successful professionals. So you couldn't tell me as often as trotted out. You can never tell me that, hey, you can't be somebody if you go to HBCU. You're going to get an inferior education if you go to HBCU. You can't be successful. It doesn't prepare you for the real world. Those were concepts which were completely foreign to not just myself, but to, to other young Black folks. So again, that exposure to HBCUs, it mattered. I think about my cohort and my friends who... I went to high school with many of us went on to attend HBCUs because we had all these successful examples of black college graduates around us. So, uh, but not only that, as I talk about in the, in the, in the conclusion of my book, I mean, the eighties and the nineties was a very special time in black colleges, right? I mean, you had different world, you had school days, you had, you know, everybody was wearing this black college gear. Uh, you know, it was, as I, as I argue in, in, the, in the conclusion of my book, um, you know, it was a golden renaissance for HBCUs in the 80s and 90s. And so, you know, I didn't want to go anywhere else. And most of my friends didn't either. So, <laughs> and, and like I said, you know, I, mistakes happen. I went to Central first and then I made, I corrected that, right? <laughs> you corrected the mistake. <laughs> so let's talk about the book, which I love the book. But one of what, what, what really struck me in the book is your framing mechanism to pick these seven colleges. Or is, the book is seven chapters for those of you who haven't read it. So it's kind of, um, I don't want to say easy, but it's a unique way to just kind of present this as seven different narratives, if I'm saying this correctly. Mm -hmm. You basically, you uh, visited Cheney State University, uh, which I've been to a great looking, beautiful campus, Tougaloo, Bennett, Alabama State, Jackson State, Southern, and of course, North Carolina a &T. So talk about your framing, why you picked these seven schools. And, you know, was there, was there thought about expanding it or why seven and why these seven? Well, there were always thoughts about expanding it. And in fact, there were a number of, of schools that um, originally were supposed to be in this book. Uh, but one of the things that you learn very quickly as a graduate student and, and as, a, as a young professor uh, trying to achieve tenure is that time is not your friend. Uh, and, and so I had to make some hard choices about the institutions um, that I wanted to include. In fact, the original, um, so this book started off really as my dissertation, which was a comparative study of two institutions, Tougaloo and Jackson State. Uh, originally, I wanted to do a comparative study of Southern and North Carolina a and mm -hmm. um, But it's really difficult to get from North Carolina to Louisiana when you're trying to, in your grad school. And so my, my advisor at that time, Dr. Hassan Jeffries said, look, we need to narrow this down. And more importantly, you need to find maybe some two institutions that are in the same, in the same setting, right? And so I looked at Mississippi because I thought that by telling the story of Jackson State and Tougaloo, both of them, if, if you've never been to Tougaloo, Tougaloo essentially sits right outside of Jackson, Mississippi. So it's essentially in the suburbs of Jackson. So that allowed me to get two institutions, tell a story of one private school, one public school, and that became the basis for, um, for the dissertation. But when I, I left um, Ohio State, um, again, it was my, my advisor, Dr. Hassan Jeffries, who said, look, you may be onto something here. Why don't you try to hit the home run and tell a broader story by incorporating other schools into the book uh, and so, or into what will become the book? And so uh, I began to look. And so I knew I really wanted to start close to the beginning. Right? Mm -hmm. And so Lincoln and Cheney, if you're not familiar with Lincoln and Cheney, they go back and forth with arguing about who was the first HBCU. Yeah. Right? So Cheney's founded in 1837, um, but they were not granting degrees. 
Lincoln's founded in 1854 or 56. <laughs> uh, and they, of course, uh, pride themselves in saying that the first degree granting inter institution. And then Wilberforce comes in, it's founded also in 1856 or 1858. And they say that, hey, we're the first HBCU because they were founded by the AME Zion Church or, or the AME Church, right? The African Methodist Episcopal Church. And so they say, well, we're the real HBCU because Lincoln was being run by white folks and Cheney was basically handing out uh, um, non, you know, uh, credential uh, uh, degrees, if you will. So they all, all three of them go back and forth in arguing this. But when you look at the history of Cheney, it's founded in 1837, and I open up the Cheney chapter with the story of, of this gentleman, Octavius Caddo. Um, and when I was exposed to the story of Octavius Caddo, I knew that's where I wanted to start my book. Mm -hmm. uh, here you have a Black college professor being assassinated in the streets of Philadelphia because he promoted and played a critical role in, in helping to bring about the 15th Amendment which gave African-American men the right to vote. That's such a powerful story. And I knew I wanted to start there. So it, the Institute for Colored Youth became the first chapter and where I began, it's 1837, it's the beginning of HBCU. So there was no better place for me to start. Uh, and then moving forward, you know, I, I'll, I'll come back and talk, I don't wanna you know, be too long-winded here, Ernie, but no, go ahead, you're um, great. You know, so let me talk about the schools that didn't make the book. <laughs> so at one point, and, and I say that because, you know, there may be, you know, folks here who are researchers themselves or, you know, have, you know, students who are thinking about going into history. And there are a number of stories that need to be told, right? Um, one of them is Virginia Union. Virginia Union originally was going to be one of the stories. Of the, Virginia Union and Howard University um, combined probably produced the most Black ministers in oh, America. Yeah. And Virginia Union had a very powerful seminary. By very powerful, I mean, it was radical. A lot of the ministers who came out of Virginia Union became early civil rights activists themselves. I want to tell Virginia Union story. I want to tell South Carolina State story. I want to tell Fisk story as well. And I'd gone to Fisk and done some preliminary research there. I also want to tell Talladega. In fact, I kind of joke in the book, I can say this now because the book came out in 2019. It's been a while. Talladega was originally going to be one of the chapters in the book but the archivist there told me, you know what, you know, I'm glad you're writing, but you're only going to be able to get access to the archive maybe two times out the week. And, you know, we've got all these limitations and these struggles. And that's real for a lot of Black college archives. They're very underfunded. They're not supported, uh, which is problematic in itself uh -huh. um, because we have to become better stewards of our history, right, and, and cherish our history. And, and not only that, but promote and celebrate our history. Um, and so Talladega, because Talladega has a very powerful story. Uh, of becoming an incubator for, for activism, even going back to the early 20th century. Uh, and I wanted to tell that, but I had to end up chopping them. So I end up with those seven schools. And I mentioned earlier that three of them deliberately are state institutions, because again, that kind of runs counter to this narrative, not well, four of them are, but I focus on three in the same time frame. I looked at uh, Alabama State, Jackson State, and Southern in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, because it's in that era that really radicalism is the most prime on Black college campus. That post-war era, World War II era, that double V campaign, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and Black students talking about double victory, and hey, we went to go fought Hitler and the Nazis, and when we come home, we're damn sure gonna fight Jim Crow too. I mean, HBCUs were explosively radical in that era. And so I wanted to, again, provide a counter narrative because so many other historians have concluded that, hey, if these state schools, you know, you have these racist white state legislators who are making sure that, you know, nobody's engaging in radicalism and um, they're shutting down college presidents. Um, but I found a completely different story. And so I really, I think the heart, I mean, I, I like the entire book, but I really love the heart of the book um, because it tells these, the story of these state institutions and how they really challenge white supremacy when people thought white supremacy cannot and should not be challenged. So we talked earlier about, you know, the, the HBC story is being untold. And um, how frustrating, and you and I talked about this at the Carter Center, how frustrating is it and what needs to be done to be able to get that stuff out? How frustrating was it for you to be able to go to these archives and not be able to get what you need or this not available? It's, it's, it's tragic, Ernie, it really is. I, I've told this story a couple of times, I'm speaking to different audiences, but I'll never forget being at Cheney State University, mm -hmm. um, the, the Institute for Colored Youth, yeah. uh, and working with the archivist there who was really a great guy and said, look, you know what? I'm glad you're writing on, on our history. 
I'm going to open it up. You got free access, which is what any historian wants to hear from uh -huh. an archivist saying, hey, come on in. This is what we got. Take a look at it. Right. But I'll never forget looking at one of their old rusted out file cabinets and there was an obstruction um, blocking the file cabinet. And I reached back into the to cabinet to, to see what was obstructing the cabinet from fully closing. And it was a wrinkled up letter and, and I pulled it out. And it was a handwritten letter from W.E.B. Du Bois wow. to the college president, uh -huh. handwritten, right? Handwritten. Uh, and, and this is how we're restoring our history, uh -huh. right? And so, um, you know, it, and other HBCUs have these same stories. Uh, and so it, it's critical um, that we support celebrating and cherishing, but also preserving our history at HBCUs. Um, tip your hat and write your check to support the archives at, at North Carolina a t State University. And I, I, and I will say this, that again, the other institutions that I work with, one of the reasons why I work with them is that again, the archivists, they opened up the door for me and there were still some challenges that they had. And, you know, some, you know, sometimes the copier wasn't working and, you know, you know, papers that should have been preserved were, were in tatters because they had never been um, fully uh, uh, taken care of. And that's history, right? I mean, when those newspapers crumble, we can't get that back, right? Yeah. And so this is one of the reasons why people support digitizing yeah. uh, um, yeah. the history and digitizing the, the, the archives and trying to preserve this. Somebody get a photo of this because, you know, those things don't last, right? You know, and so the other flip side of that, which is the ironic flip side, is that, uh, uh, and, and, but it's also a hard reality, is that one of the other sources for the book, especially in the latter chapters, were oral histories, mm -hmm. right? talking to folks. And much like papers, guess what? People don't survive either. And yeah. so this is a nod. If you do family histories, you got older folks in your family, talk to these folks, get them on, get them on tape. Because again, people pass away and sometimes they take that knowledge with them. Mm -hmm. And so where I could fill in those gaps, I did. For instance, uh, the Bennett chapter, the Bennett chapter opens up with the story of Hattie Bailey. Uh -huh. um, this 90 plus year old woman who was a, a former student at Bennett in the 1930s, late 1940s. I'll never forget being a, 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 a researcher. I was on fellowship at Duke. And I said, you know what? I'm a, it's, it's a shot in the dark, but I'm gonna try to see if this woman is still alive. <laughs> and so I, I, I did some combing around and sure enough, I found her and I called her and she was living in Philadelphia. This uh -huh. is a, a Bennett Bell. She's in uh -huh. her 90s. But and so I called her, I said, you know, look, um, Ms. Bailey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm Dr. Jelani Faves, I'm doing research on Bennett. And, and before I could even go further, the first thing she said to me, which I, I, I point out in the book, she said, Bennett College. She said, I learned how to speak at Bennett College. Uh, uh. I mean, and, and not speak in the literal sense. Uh -huh. but what she's saying is, is that somebody at Bennett sold seeds of confidence in me. Right. And, and, and they encouraged me and they emboldened me. And this woman went on to become a major player and a major activist on campus in the 1930s uh, at uh -huh. Bennett College. But she learned how to speak. She found her voice at Bennett College. And, and mm -hmm. so that's th those are the type of stories that we can't we can't preserve that. Right. And again, that was in 2013. I don't know if Ms. Bailey is still with us because I haven't spoken with her in years. But, you know, if I didn't get that story now, we were never going to know about H Hattie Bailey yeah. and, and, and what HBCUs have meant to generations of young Black people, and how generations of young Black people found their voice, found their confidence mm -hmm. at HBCUs. You say, I, I love that quote, uh, that's where I learned to speak. And one of the things, you know, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, Instagram, I've been wearing T-shirts every day since the pandemic started. And shout out to Shaw. Huh? Said, shout out to Shaw. I saw you yeah. up at Shaw University today. Yeah, I did Shaw today. <laughs> Mother uh, Shaw. I've switched over to sweatshirts. So I've, I've switched over and I wore Shaw today. Um, but one of the things that I don't think a lot of people talk about, and you mentioned um, Institute for Color Youth, Lincoln and Wilberforce are all Northern colleges. And HBCU started basically, we think of the South when we think of HBCUs. I think a lot of people do. And it wasn't until what, 1865 that Shaw University started as the first Southern HBCU. I think Atlanta University started in 1865 as well, but I think Shaw gets that distinction of being the first. So talk about, when you talk about finding a voice, what kind of voice did black colleges give the South 
which had been up until then disenfranchised. Blacks have been disenfranchised. All of, we were disenfranchised all over the country, but particularly in the South. And what Shaw University kind of opened up as for Southern HBCUs. Right, and, and, and you know, what's very clear, and I know, you know, there are a lot of educated folks in here and we're all HBCU graduates, many of us. Um, and, and we already know this legacy and part of the history. And that is this, is that it was illegal to educate black folks. Black folks were considered dangerous as, as literate, as a literate part of the population. Um, you can go back to, to incidents such as Nat Turner in the 1830s, you know, people saying, hey, we're gonna make sure that we ban reading. Why? Because uh, uh, Nat Turner uh, and David Walker, you know, these are folks who are literate, who are, who are dangerous to the population. So fast forward to 1865, we get black institutions in the South beginning to train and educate young African-Americans who are, many of them are, are newly freed themselves. And many of them are the sons and daughters of folks who are newly free. Um, and so this was, you know, back in the 90s, I'm sure many of y'all will remember this, but y'all remember, uh, uh, what was it? Dangerous and, and black and educated t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. Everybody used to wear. I mean, that's real, right? You know, that's real. In fact, I opened up the book with a, a quote from, from Du Bois who said, um, in fact, let me, let me see if I can just find it right quick. He says this in the soul of black folks, right? He says, for the South believed an educated Negro to be a dangerous Negro. And the South was not wholly wrong for education among all kinds of men always has had and always will have an element of danger and revolution of disaffection and discontent, right? I, I knew from the jump, I wanted to open up my book with, that's the very first thing in the yeah. book, right? So that's the very first thing I wrote because what that speaks to is what these institutions represented. White folks already knew that the idea of educating black folks was a dangerous proposition, which is why they tried to make sure that the black folks were not permitted to, 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 to read uh, during, during slavery. But coming out of, of slavery, we see Shaw, we see Fisk, we see many of these institutions, Tougaloo, uh, uh, many of these institutions were created by something called the AMA, the American Missionary Association. Mm -hmm. right, so Fisk, Morehouse, Talladega, these are all AMA, AM, AMA schools. And what you see, and again, this is why the title of this book is so, so important here, right? Shelters in a time of storm, because many white folks who are become the benefactors of these institutions who are writing the checks, they assume, right? Like, like William Watkins said that, hey, these young black kids are being taught to comply. They're mm -hmm. being taught to, to be complicit, to not question to not push back against Jim Crow and white supremacy. And so many of them supported these institutions with that understanding. You know, probably the best example of this is Tuskegee, right? And Booker T. Booker T. Washington played that to a T, right? Believing that, hey, I'm gonna coddle up to white folks and, and tell them, hey, we can be one as a hand and, and separate as the fingers, right? That's yeah, what, yeah. what Du Bois says. I'm not Du Bois, but that's what Booker T. Washington yeah. says, you know, to, to white folks in order to, for them to write those checks to create Tuskegee. And guess what? Fast forward to 2021, Tuskegee is still here with us, right? It's still the pride of the swift growing South, right? But what we know is that within Tuskegee, within North Carolina a and within Shaw, we do see a second curriculum emerging, right? So on the outside, you know, white America believes that, hey, these HBCUs are creating a, a, a group of docile workers who will be complicit with Jim Crow and white supremacy. But what we know is taking place on the inside especially in the Deep South, is that young Black students are finding seeds of radicalism. And many of them are planting seeds of radicalism within the HBCU environment. So if I could very, really quickly, Ernie, yeah. the, the, other, the other thing I talk about in my book, um, I, I borrow a term called communitas, okay. um, which is a term I borrow from a cultural anthropologist by the name of Victor Turner. But communitas simply gave me another way to describe HBCU space. Okay. Right? Because in the concept of communitas, what this cultural anthropologist Victor Turner really suggesting and arguing is that communitas was about relationship and, 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 and rites of passage. And that was the perfect description of what black colleges really represented during this, during, it was a different and radical different space, right? I mean, as I said before, Chapel Hill is not a right? Mm -hmm. uh, Harvard is not Howard. 
right? In, in, in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s, predominantly white institutions are actually leading the charge in teaching that black folks are inferior, mm -hmm. right? They're promoting the idea of that black folks should not be allowed to vote. Meanwhile, the Institute for Colored Youth, Octavius Caddo and his friends are saying, hey, we're, not only are we gonna vote, but we're gonna lead the charge to vote. Why? Because that's the type of energy that flows within this space. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, mm -hmm. and again, that that energy is the second curriculum, and the communitas is the space. And when you combine those two together, you get these seed beds for activism. And, and this is why the, the the creation of institutions of higher learning throughout the South becomes vitally important. It, it creates a, a now a platform where generations of Black folks can graduate from the Shaws and the Fisk and the Talladega and the Tougaloo's, and they can assume their place uh, in the long movement for Black liberation. It seems like, um, I guess around since the last time we talked, since November, HBCUs have gotten a lot of attention because of Kamala Harris, going to Howard, Stacey Abrams, who uh, it was just announced today that she was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. She went to Spelman. Raphael mm -hmm. Warnock went to uh, Morehouse College. So do you see HBCUs uh, getting a lot of attention now? Do you see that as an uprise? And is that a good thing? It's a great thing. <laughs> attention is always good, right? Mm -hmm. And um, but but also I want that attention to be placed on HBCUs um, in a way in which it highlights what we've done the best. Okay. Uh, and I had a talk earlier today, and, and I mentioned this to um, some folks out in California uh, that the most important contribution the HBCUs have ever made is reshaping and remaking the social and political contours of America through activism. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, happy Aggie Pride Day. Right. February 1st matters because and, and February 1st isn't the beginning of student activism at HBCUs. Mm -hmm. But what it really signaled is that HBCUs were going to be a powerful weapon in the deconstruction of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in doing so, it continued to produce people like the folks that you've mentioned. It also produced people like Jesse Jackson. Right, you know, who, who was the first to make an, a, a strong, aggressive run um, for the presidency of the United States of, of America. Of course, I'm not diminishing the impact of, of Shirley Chisholm sure, as well, sure. but, uh, but clearly Jesse, you know, he, again, in the 80s, as HBCUs are experiencing this, uh, this, this renaissance, this golden renaissance of black college life, it's Jesse saying, keep hope alive, right? It's really kind of pushing the movement forward and bringing attention to HBCUs. And so black colleges, have been that type of space in producing this type of leadership. Uh, and, and so I think one of the things that I hope that we see moving forward is that increasingly we understand that black colleges simply aren't about bands. They simply aren't about parties. They aren't about um, the show, social atmosphere. Again, shout out to Beyonce who said, hey, if she could do it all over again, you know, she would have gone to HBCU. Uh, and, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh -huh. Right. But again, you're celebrating the cultural pageantry of black college life without also understanding the political role of HBCU life and how it has reshaped this nation. And we have to remember that as black mm -hmm. colleges uh, and continue to produce, again, the Reverend Warnock's and and and, and the, the, the Ibram X. Kendi's, uh, who, of course, went to Florida A&M yeah, yeah. uh, and the Kamala Harris. And went to, we, we want to continue to end the shout out to our mayor, uh, um, Keisha Lance Bottoms, who also went to Florida A&M. You know, we're, we're still producing that type of leadership, uh, but we also need to keep focus on that second curriculum, right, of yeah. race consciousness, idealism, cultural nationalism, if we're going to continue to do that moving forward. Yeah, one of the frustrating things for me, and I, you know, I, I love HBCUs. I've travel to probably not as many as you have. But you know, when when we do get on television, you know, Central's playing basketball tonight, there is a lot of focus on the band, you know, and step shows and the Greek fraternities. And, and I think sometimes we get overshadowed by what you're talking about, that kind of glitz about how fun it is to go to an HBCU right. when you're kind of missing out on the STEM programs and the history programs and the history of the universities. Right. I think that's kind of just one of my little frustrations. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm happy for the attention. Sometimes I think it's kind of misguided. Uh, and and I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, I mean, let's be very clear. Uh, and I said this the other day in a, in a, in a talk I was given in Louisiana. Uh, before there was ever a, a phrase of black boy joy or black girl magic mm -hmm. or, or black excellence, HBCUs provided that type of space yeah. for joy, for magic, right, for excellence. 
And so generations of young people who came to that space, they felt the freedom to be themselves, right? To be unapologetically black. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. And we, we need to continue to celebrate that. And so again, the pageantry of, of D9 life, um, the pageantry of Black college uh, life in terms of, of parties and, and, and bands, that's a very large part of who we are, right? Mm -hmm. But we can't lose sight of what we've done the best and the most important contributions we've made in this country. And that is challenging America to look into the mirror and deal with that great American paradox, right? Uh, to, 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 to confront who we are as a racist nation and to again, to begin to deconstruct that. That's the power of the Sutton curriculum and what students who've, been, who've come to these institutions, what they've been exposed to and how they've left these institutions, not just as, as leaders within their respective fields of life, but also how they have served as cultural change agents. HBCUs have to, to continue to push that and promote that uh, if we're going to remain relevant moving forward. Mm. And a and you know, a and obviously is now the largest HBCU in the country. It's doing very well. Uh, Central's doing well. I didn't hear you already say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Something's wrong with my, my speaker. <laughs> but you got A&T, admittedly, is doing very, very well. You guys are doing a great job and congratulations. Central's doing well. Howard, Morehouse, Spelman, the typical colleges. But where do you see, you know, there's, you know, I've wrote a, a series of stories about three or four years ago about black colleges. And a lot of experts are saying that, you know, maybe in 50 years, we're only going to have about 75 or 50 black colleges. Where do you see us going in the next 50 to 75 years, 50 years? Well, you know, I would love to look into that crystal ball and say that, that all of us will be here. Um, I think the reality shows that uh, perhaps that's not the case, right? When we look at the legacy of these institutions, contraction has been a part of that legacy that a number of institutions uh, have indeed diminished and many of them have closed their doors. Uh, but I think it's also, um, it's exciting to see schools like Morris Brown um, get a lifeline, right, and, and, and perhaps headed back into the fold. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm excited and, and I'm hopeful about the future of, of our school across the street, our sisters, Bennett College, and, and what the future represents for them. Um, we need these institutions, Ernie. Um, that, that's simple and, simple and plain, is that we need Black colleges to survive and to thrive. And that's going to take an a all-hands-on-deck effort, um, not just from, from, from the state, uh, and from federal benefactors, but as alumni, we've got to open up our pocketbooks, right? Mm -hmm. We've got to give back um, to these institutions. Uh, we can't simply say Aggie pride uh, and not cut a check with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if we want to be uh, proud of our institution and support our institution and wear the colors of our institution, then we have to support uh, um, that institution financially as well. We can't wait for the handout. Now, again, that does not also disconnect the fact that, and I've said this before in a number of different talks, is that, and let's be very clear, black colleges are old reparation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talk about reparations and the significance of the reparations argument, um, but clearly states and, and federal governments maintain a system of separate uh, uh, and unequal, right? And they said separate but equal, but it was separate and unequal. And for generations, black colleges floundered underneath that and suffered underneath the great weight of debt of crumbling infrastructure. Uh, I gave a talk about a year ago. In fact, it was probably almost a year to a date at Tennessee State University. Um, shout out to Tennessee State and the Tigers uh, mm -hmm. of Tennessee State University. But when I arrived on that campus, it was heartbreaking to see some of the crumbling infrastructure at mm -hmm. Tennessee State, knowing that at UT Knoxville, it's a completely different looking campus. Yeah. So here you have two state institutions, two state schools, yeah. right? Yeah. Two state schools who clearly have a different type of environment, which clearly have been impacted by segregation and racism and funding. Uh, and yet that has not been fully addressed. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, you know, again, we look at what just occurred in, in Maryland, um, where many of the, the, the state institutions, HBCUs in Maryland have sued the state essentially for back pay saying, hey, pay us what you owe us. That's an argument that could be made by every HBCU in the country. Yeah. Pay us what you owe us. Because again, if you want to talk about uh, the crippling state of HBCUs in terms of infrastructure, uh, in, in terms of, of, of support, um, we know that that has been impacted by a legacy of, 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 of disproportionate funding fueled by racism. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get back to the book a little bit. I saw earlier before we jumped on that there are a few people online who are not Aggies. So, and there are, uh, there are some people who just bought the book. So let's talk about the a chapter for a little bit. 
about you know what you what 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 was going on in that space that you were writing about and and how what kind of impact did that have so i wrote that chapter you know a lot of people you know kind of dig into me and say you wrote that chapter because you went to ant right that's why you wrote it right <laughs> <laughs> um and, and you know, of course, I make no qualms, no type of uh, regrets whatsoever for about writing uh, about North Carolina A and T. But I knew I wanted to write about North, write about North Carolina A and T in the Black Power era, because even in A and T, that's an area that we don't really discuss enough, right? We and again, this is not to diminish the, the significance and the impact of the A and T four and the sit-ins. We talk about the sit-ins a lot. Right, uh, but we don't talk about it nearly. We don't talk about uh, uh, um, um, the the '69 revolt, you know, nearly enough, right? And what that meant to to have the National Guard storm our campus and to shoot up our campus, uh, and for Willie Grimes to be killed. We don't talk about that uh, uh, nearly enough. Um, but it was actually um, this book, which really kind of inspired me. If you haven't read this book, I encourage you to read this as well. This is Civilities and Civil. Oh yeah. Rights. Um, I read by one of my. Year, I read that freshman year at Central. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I read it when I was at A T as well. Yeah. But it's written by William Shafe, who was one of my my mentors when I was at Duke. He, he taught at Duke yeah. for a number of years before retiring. Um, but it's in that book that that Will Chafe, uh, uh, Bill Chafe, um, documents the fact that A T. Not he doesn't say A T, but he says Greensboro was the headquarters uh, and the center of the Black Power movement in the 1960s for the entire South. Mm -hmm. So he kind of let, lays the, the, the template and the, and the blueprint for saying, if you want to talk about Black power in the South, it comes through Greensboro. It was one of the most significant um, centers for that in terms of the energy um, that centered around that. Of course, you have the Greensboro Association of Poor People. You have the Student Organization of Black Unity. Um, you have all these different entities. You have the, the presence of Malcolm X Liberation University, which relocated from Durham to Greensboro. Well, mm -hmm. the whole reason why all those entities and organizations are existing at that point is because of the energy being generated by ANT. Uh, and, and so ANT was that powerhouse of radicalism and had been going back to February 1st, 1960, all the way through the 1960s. And so I knew I wanted to tell the story of ANT during, during, during the Black Power era, because again, uh, um, there was such, it's such a rich story uh, mm -hmm. uh, about how the, the, the communitas and how the second curriculum really continues to unfold even into the late 60s and early 1970s. Black students are being exposed to racial con race consciousness and idealism and cultural nationalism. There's a part in the book where I talk about Dr. Dowdy, uh, mm -hmm. who of course who was president of ANT in the late 1960s, Dr. Dowdy uh, coming out and saying, hey, I agree with y'all. You know, I think we should build a, a, a black grocery store. <laughs> I mean, think of, uh, let, let's bring dollars back to the black, that's our president. Yeah, our yeah. college president in the late 1960s, arguing about cultural nationalism, arguing about you know this idea of, of black is beautiful and how we should support uh, uh, um, economically the community, and then he goes a step further and he creates a, a partnership and a relationship um, with local black folks in the community, and they're in conversation with black college professors at A&T, black college administrators, and they're prescribing solutions to their problems. Mm -hmm. right? How do we solve East Market Street? How do we how do we begin to address the so that, that's just a powerful story to tell and mm -hmm. ANT gave me the the platform and the ability to to really kind of construct that story and to uh, um, to make it known that hey when we say Aggie Pride that goes from from 1891 all the way through uh, um, the Black Power era Black Power era included as well as up to this very day. You guys say Aggie Pride a lot. I got to tell you that. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it, but I don't know. But <laughs> you get it, Ernie. You, you, you know what Aggie Pride means. <laughs> um, so okay, so you, you you write a lot about activism. You you know, you that's what that's where you are. So is are you seeing that now on on black college campuses now? You know, we got the Black Lives Matter movement going on, but is that coming out of black colleges? Is it coming out of black college leadership? That's a great question. Um, you know, so one of my, my major concerns, um, and this is a concern that, uh, again, is rooted in the legacy of the civil rights movement and what so many students in the 60s, what they wanted to eschew and not be a part of, they didn't want to be reactionary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to uh, uh, prescribe solutions and be um, cultural change agents themselves. Uh, and, and so you, you fast forward to, to 2021, 
Um, one of the things I think that we see sometimes emerging, particularly from the social media universe that so many of our students love, uh, mm -hmm. and not just our students, but uh, you know, Americans in general, we fall in love with social media, is that it has the, the, the tendency to be reactionary, right? Things begin to trend on mm -hmm. Twitter, on Twitter. Right? A name begins to trend, an event begins to trend. But then what happens when it's not trending anymore? Mm -hmm. right? What happens when that energy begins to dissipate? And, and so I think moving forward, uh, HBCUs can still be that shelter in a time of storm. And I don't think that's questionable. In fact, I think one of the reasons why you see an uptick now in Black college enrollment is because a number of Black students are deciding they want to come home. They don't want to be exposed to the hostile, racist environment that they find in a lot of these PWIs. Mm -hmm. But again, as I make this argument in the book, what type of space are we going to welcome them back to? Mm -hmm. right? Is the second curriculum still alive and thriving and well? How are humanities and social sciences at these institutions? Are we supporting them? Are we funding them? Are we making sure that our students can be exposed to, a, a cl to classes and to a curriculum where they can learn about the legacy and history of white supremacy and how black college students have been agents for, for social and political change? Uh, because again, this is no disrespect to the STEM fields, but there's certain conversations that go on in a history class that isn't going on in computer science, mm -hmm. right? There's certain conversations that go on in political science classes uh, um, that aren't going on in other spaces. And so supporting those curriculums are vitally important. In a couple of weeks, uh, I'm giving a talk at, at uh, uh, Prairie View a and um, where um, uh, uh, Dr. Simmons, uh, they just opened up the Ruth Simmons Center for Race and Social Justice, uh -huh. Prayer View and AM. So shout uh -huh. out to Prayer View AM for doing that. And Dr. Well, Simmons, the first black uh, president of a Ivy League, right? Yeah, she was president of Brown College yeah. for a long time, left Brown, came to Prayer View. So again, shout out to her for making that move. But the question is how is it that an institution that led the push? for deconstructing white supremacy and fighting the civil rights on February 1st, 1960. How is it and why is it that we don't have a center for race and social justice? Where mm -hmm. is ANT center mm -hmm. for race and social justice? Where is Winston-Salem State Center? Where is North Carolina Central Center? All HBCUs need to have and fund efforts to develop policy, right? Which can help us think critically about how we can solve some of the problems in our communities, uh, um, but also to, to serve as a, a rebuke of, of white supremacy as we find it uh, within our societies. And again, I, you know, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I mean, January the 6th was a moment in American history where we clearly see right, white nationalism, white supremacy is alive and well, mm -hmm. right? And so if, there's, if there was ever a need for, for, for shelters <laughs> in a time of storm, it's now we are in a storm, right? Yeah, yeah. But again, what are these students gonna find when they arrive in these campuses. And like you, I think you were alluding to Ernie, um, you know, are, are they gonna come to these institutions and are they going to um, learn to prescribe solutions for these problems? Uh, or are they simply gonna be reacting to what they see and hear on social media? And when that's no longer trending, will the conversation move somewhere else, right? It's, it's kind of a di like a different path, but one of the chapters you write about Jackson State University, I'm not sure if you've been watching what Deion Sanders is doing. Uh, for you, those of you who don't know, Deion Sanders, the you know prime time is now the new head football coach for Jackson State University, and he's trying to get these five-star football players to come to Jackson State to kind of change the narrative um, of you know why not come home to play for us so they can perhaps challenge AT in a football game. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, know. I, know. I, know. I was going to say that they could still still take that L. Meet us on the corner of Sullivan and Lindsay, right? <laughs> but he's still he's still opening up that conversation about come okay. here, come back home, you know, especially with all that's going on in the country. And it's a timely conversation, right? And again, it's not just students who are making that decision. But as you're pointing out, Ernie, it's student athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, and I, and I touch on this in the epilogue of the book, right? And what we clearly understand and know is that integration really kind of killed um, the, the, the athletic supremacy that yeah. HBCUs had exhibited for years in this country because all the top flight <clears throat> black elite talent attended and, and went to HBCUs. They went to the Gramblings. They went to the Florida a and They went to, to, to the Southern universities. And they went to the North Carolina anti-state universities. And I guess in some ways they went to North Carolina Central as well, right? But, but uh, what we clearly see now is a moment in history 
where a number of them are making a conscious decision, you know what, I can still get to the pros and, and go to a North Carolina ante, which someone like Tariq Cohen has yeah. exhibited, right? Someone like a Brandon Parker has exhibited that. These are, are athletes from AT who are now playing professional professional ball, right? And so are and Daryl Johnson as well for, for Buffalo. So there, we see that trend now beginning to take place. And I hope that it continues um, because I think what it touches on is, is not just simply saying we can be a catalyst and a catapult for you to move to the next level of professional sports, but that you are, are gonna be treated not just as a number here, right? Mm -hmm. You are not an object for us to simply cheer on and to celebrate while you're running the football, right? You know, I often get sick to my stomach, right? To, to watch, you know, shout out to, to SEC football, right? We're in Georgia, yeah. but I mean, you look at the, the, these crowds who, who fall in to the football stadiums at, 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 at Ole Miss, right? And the University of Alabama, right? You, these are the same people who have voted for and supported policy and, and continue support po to support policy and politicians who clearly do not believe in the same type of freedom dreams for black people that we do, right? Yeah, well, yeah. they'll cheer, us, cheer, cheer our students on while they're playing for them. Right? And then completely ignore black folks when they're attending the classroom, right? You yeah. know, when they are, are, are uh, uh, average everyday students on this campus. And so I think what is taking place and what I hope is taking place is that black athletes are realizing that, you know what, I, I, wanna, I wanna chart a different course. You know, mm -hmm. I wanna write a different story and I'm gonna attend an HBCU uh, and, and I can thrive there and I could be loved there, whether I'm playing on Saturday or whether I'm in class on Monday or Tuesday, uh, and, and, and I think that's something that, that, uh, that more HBCUs need to promote. Okay. So I see there's like 99 comments in the chat. I'm not sure how many of those are questions. So I want to ask you two more questions before we jump over to, um, if that's okay with you, Tina, before we jump over to, uh, viewer questions. Um, when you think about HBCUs, you know, you have the standard ones, you have the Spelman, the Morehouses. Those are ones that people talk about a lot. Um, a and T over the last ten years has been a school that people have started to talk about a lot. What do you, where do you attribute what? And this is for the people who probably aren't Aggies who are on the call, including myself. But what do you attribute to where A and T has gone? How you've gotten there? And it seems to me that you've gotten there very fast. And do you have any thoughts about you know just what A and T perhaps is doing right? Visionary leadership. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think the leadership of, of our chancellor, Dr. Martin, and again, it's not to diminish, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a Fort baby. So, you know, my president was, was Dr. Fort, uh -huh. uh, but Harold Martin has, has come to a and and he is on fire in terms of the decisions that he's, he's making. Uh, and not only that, but we also see, you know, it's, it's an era where um, STEM is in vogue, right? You know, everybody's talking about STEM. Um, so why not come to the HBCU that, that produces the most black engineers in the country? Why not come to an HBCU that, that has uh, incredible programs, other STEM related programs? Uh, and, and so that's part of that, that, that charge. Uh, and I think uh, some of it too has been, and you know, I'd be remiss in saying, but, and, and I know we probably feel a certain way about this in Atlanta, but the celebration bowl didn't hurt. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. be, being able to turn on ABC and, 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 and watch HBCUs uh, 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 battle it out and a be be successful um, four times out of five that 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 has uh, that bowl has taken place. Um, even our own administrators say that they saw an uptick in in, um, uh, in enrollment um, during that time. And so it's simply about achieving a platform, right? And and ABC and the Celebration Bowl gave us a platform that we might not have had uh, in the past. But but social media now is um, giving these institutions platforms. I wouldn't be surprised to see Jackson State's enrollment going up because yeah. of all of the attention that uh, attention that that Deion Sanders is uh, is attracting. So, um, but again, I think my concern is, and I think all of our concerns should be, uh, is that when they arrive at a place like a t what type of space is going to envelop them? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what type of 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 curriculum are they going to be exposed to? And I have no doubt that AT will continue to produce luminaries, continue to produce uh, activists, continue to produce um, uh, uh, leaders within their respective fields. Um, but I also hope that we'll continue to produce um, politically and socially conscious individuals who will serve as, as change, change agents uh, within their local communities. And not just AT, but all HBCUs, I hope, are, are continuing to strive to do this. And again, that, that goes through supporting the STEM fields and also goes through supporting humanities and social sciences uh, as well. 
Okay. Let's talk. Last question, and I'll, I'll get some more questions after some of the other questions. But I want to talk a little bit about resilience uh, and, and resilience that we've learned at HBCUs. So I was reading something and kind of researching you about when you were writing, and, and writing a book is tough. I, you know, I've been, you know, I've been working on a book for a while. Writing a book is tough. That's tough work. There's a lot of mental work. There's a lot of scholarship that goes into that. And you were teaching at HBCU in Baltimore, and you hadn't finished the book, and your department was unsatisfied with that, so they let you go, or you left uh, right at the- I didn't leave. They okay. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> but right when your tenure discussion was gonna start happening. Right. You, you, you know, you, you left. But I'm not sure how quickly it happened, but things started to go right for you. So talk about just how, um, how you were able to get back up from that. And, I, and in, in, in how, you know, yeah, okay, just how you were able to get back up from that. Ernie, first of all, I want to say I, I've been, you know, speaking, you know, since the book came out at, at quite different places. You're the first person to ask me that, and thank you for asking me that. And I really appreciate that because it, it is uh, a part of, of my story. Um, you know, as I said before, when I was an AT, you know, I had folks who believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And there were people who, who believed in my research, who knew that I was not some scholar wasting time. I had already produced, uh, um, you know, academic work, uh, published academic work. Um, you know, I had one, I was the inaugural recipient of a, of a major fellowship at Duke. Uh, and Morgan State simply made the decision that they didn't want to in invest in me anymore. And there's a, a tons of reasons why that decision was made that I don't really want to get into right, right now. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I left Morgan or they left me. Okay. Uh, and I, I made a call, actually. I made a, a call to, to Duke University, where I had my first fellowship in 2009. Um, and uh, I didn't, you know, I was simply wanting advice from some of my mentors at Duke University about what's next, right? Where should I, what should I do? You know, how do I pick myself back up? Because um, I, again, the book was, you know, over halfway done, and I wanted to get it out. Uh, and it was, as I said before, I'm simply calling for advice. But it was mm -hmm. one of my mentors at Duke who said, look, come back here, right? Mm. We want you back at Duke, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna fund the, the project again, right? Which, which resulted in me becoming a humanities writ large fellow, mm -hmm. uh, which was again, sadly ironic, is that I have a, a established elite PWI believing more in me as a scholar yeah. than an HBCU who knew that I was producing a book on black colleges. Yeah, yeah. So visionary leadership is important for HBCUs, but it's also important for us to make sure that we rid ourselves of, of poor leadership. Yeah. Uh, and there was, you know, the decision to, to get rid of me was a bad decision. Okay. And I think Morgan State understands that now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but um, you know, so I, I went back to Duke on fellowship um, while I was there, when I was in Baltimore, um, Taylor Branch is a, a resident of Baltimore. He and I had actually served on a panel um, together. Uh, and I had sent him an email too, simply saying, hey, you know what? You know, I'm a young researcher. Um, you know, I've been informed by your Pulitzer Prize winning work on Dr. King and other stuff that he had written. Um, and that was really it. I just wanted to kind of introduce myself after he and I had been on this panel. And he gave me a call out the blue when I was working at Duke saying, uh -huh. hey, I'm about to teach this class on the civil rights movement are you interested in, in teaching this class with me, you know, as a co-teacher? Mm -hmm. uh, and again, that was one of those fall out of seats moment where, wait a minute, I have a Pulitzer Prize winning author asking me if I want to teach a class with him at the University of Baltimore. So yeah. it was just, you know, it, it's, it's God's blessing, man, you know, mm -hmm. divine providence. And, and, and so I, I'll never forget when, when Morgan made that decision, one of my, my friends, good friends told me, and you know, you never want to hear stuff like this when you're going through, but one of my friends told me, she said, you know, they just did you the best favor that they could ever ask. I'm like, what do you mean they did me a favor by letting me go? But, but you know, again, from there, I got a call to come teach at an institution that I had never heard of before, Clayton State University. <laughs> um, but, I, but I knew Clayton County, as I said before, I, you know, I, I got family in the area. So I said, wait a minute, is this Clayton that's in Atlanta? You know, <laughs> hey, you know, who, what, who black doesn't want to live in Atlanta, right? And so uh, my wife actually, as I said before, she's a Hampton grad, but uh -huh. uh, she um, uh, went to grad school at Emory. Um, oh, okay, okay. In public health. Uh -huh. And so when we were dating, when I was at Ohio State, uh, she was at Emory, we were doing this sort of long distance thing. And, and uh, so that gave us the opportunity to reconnect in a city that we both love. Uh, so we moved to Atlanta in 2014. 
and, and, and the book uh, uh, contract came in 2016, uh, and then it came out in, in 2019, and it hit the ground running. And uh, it's it's just been it's been a, an incredible road. Um, mm -hmm. As I said before, this is a a, a rag to riches kind of story, but I, I'm glad to to uh, um, tell the story of HBCUs and what they've represented. And I'm glad that it finally got out there because again, there was an HBCU who tried to make sure that the story never got out. And that's, yeah, yeah. that's sad, um, but that, that's, that's the reality of it. Um, but it did get out and, and it's, it's won multiple awards and it's doing well and, and uh, I'm excited about that. We, before we jumped on, Faith Smith talked about reading the book, reading a couple of chapters. And she talked about how great the book was and she told you how great the book, how much she loved it. When you hear that, what do you think about? when people respond to you that way about the book? Um, you know, I, honestly, you know, it, it's, it, it's emotional. Even as she was telling me, I was kind of choking up and fighting back to this because, you know, th this is, it's, it's, it's something that almost didn't happen. And all I ever wanted to do, Ernie, um, was to represent, represent and tell the legacy of black colleges, mm -hmm. um, which is a powerful story to tell. Uh, and so to hear people say, hey, you know what? Not only that, that she read the book, but you know, I got on Google and started looking for Ebenezer Bassett and I wanted to know more and, and, and you kind of led me on this path. Um, that, that's, as a historian, that's what you want to hear, right? You know, I, I mentioned this in the, in the previously, I didn't expound upon it. When I was at a and um, there was a conference that we used to, used to put on um, in the history department. And the name of the conference was called Missing Pages. Okay. Uh, and as a historian, that's all we ever really want to do, right? Is fill in these missing pages. One of my favorite rappers used to say, put some paint where it ain't, right? Okay. That's what we wanted to do. We want to just put, put a little paint where it ain't, right? And I think that what Shelter in Time of Storm has really done is that it's filled in those missing pages. It's put some paint where it ain't, had, ain't been before. And that is filling in the legacy of Black colleges and what they represent. And so uh, I'm happy that, that the book has received that type of, of love. And again, I, I thank you, Faye, for, for, for that, uh, uh, that comment, because it means that um, the book is doing what, what it was intended to do, and that is to reach not just an academic um, audience, but also to re reach a lay audience of folks who are, who are junior historians and part-time historians and folks who simply love Black college life and want to learn more about Black college life. That's the other thing that I, I, I'll quickly say that I've really been uh, emotional about. Again, I talk about seven HBCUs in this book, right? And, and I can't tell the story of all of them. But mm -hmm. I've had so many people come up to me from Morehouse, from Spelman, mm -hmm. from other institutions who didn't attend any of these schools and say, hey, this is, is my story too. There's some really great news. I won't tell the full part of it because it hasn't been officially announced yet. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an institution that's going to, a, a very well-known institution that plans to adopt this uh, as its first year reader. Um, for, oh, wow. For okay. college Congratulations. Uh, and, and that's huge. Uh, and, and so that, that's what I want. I, I want this book to get into the hands uh, at, of, of, of Black college students so they can simply, so they can know that, again, it's not simply about the cultural pageantry and the bands. And again, I want to pledge AKA, I want to pledge Delta, I want to pledge Alpha, you know, but also understanding that you are part of a long legacy of Black activism that's emerged out of these institutions. And we're expecting you and we need you to be a part of that legacy moving forward. All right, all right. Now, before we turn it over to Tina, uh, you mentioned the conferences that you guys uh, had. I was only aware of the Aggie Fest as a conference. I didn't realize you guys had actually academic conferences. There. <laughs> oh, the yeah. Aggie Fest was a different type of conference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Tina, do we have any questions uh, from uh, the audience? Yes, first of all, I want to thank both of you. This has been an awesome program thus far. And we do have several questions. Um, Cheryl Graham is co hosting with me. And her and I are just going to tag team. So Cheryl, did you want to go ahead and ask the first question? Yes, but first I want to address Dr. Favors. This was amazing. Thank you for opening up um, and sharing this light with us. And it makes me think of, I don't even know the, the sermon or, or the, um, the book in the Bible, but God put you on a hill to shine your light. And now it's time to shine your light and it's shining brightly for us all and so i just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because i'm, I'm so emotional up. right now and everybody knows i'm all hype about a t that got me even more hype about a t and i thank you for shedding the light on hbcus in general so 
Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. And, and I look, I, I'm a, I'm a crier, so don't you know it don't take <laughs> much. Too. But but uh, but thank you, Sherry. That means so much to me. And Aggie Pride, sister, I really appreciate Aggie it. Pride. Aggie Pride. Okay, so the first question: When you read the statement from W. E. B. Du Bois speaking on the benefits of our meeting and congregating, how could you not reflect on how A. T. has glamorized our G our GEO? Uh, well, I mean, you know. Glamorization of, of homecomings and again, I refer to it as the cultural pageantry of, of black college life. Um, that's a part of what we do, mm -hmm. right? As I said before, I think that's, and I think it's a necessary part of what we do, right? Uh, you know, again, you know, there's so few spaces um, uh, uh, throughout black America where black folks are free and unbridled to engage in joy. Uh, and, 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 you know, what better space than GEO, right? You know, and, and that's what GEO is really represent. That's what all black college homecomings and the space itself have represented, a space where, where black folks can be free, uh, black folks can celebrate, um, black folks can, can, can reflect on their achievements as a people. Uh, and, and, and so black college life and, and black college homecomings are an extension of that. Uh, and that's a necessary part of who, that, that's a survival mechanism um, for black folks, right? To be able to, to celebrate and to be joyous and to, to develop camaraderies. Uh, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we all uh, have had friends who we've connected with when we were a &T, many of whom we're still friends with today, right? Um, whether it's fraternity brothers, sorority sisters, or just friends you met in the, in the dorm, you know, friends that you met in the cab, that becomes a part of that, that nurturing community, right, that you develop. As, as I said before, communitas is about developing social relationship, right? And so social relationship in itself becomes an act of activism, right, an act of protest, right, that we refute the, the, the pressures of white supremacy, which are, are crushing us on all sides. And we embrace the fact um, that we have something to be joyous about and to celebrate and to develop friends while we're doing it, friendships that will last a lifetime. And we'll come back here every year at the greatest homecoming on earth to remember and to reconnect those bonds. That's a very important part of what black colleges represent. If I could, the reason I brought that question up, Dr. Favors was because of the the tone in which W.B. Du Bois references that in his book, mm -hmm. the Education of Black Black People, I believe, uh, the Ten Critiques mm -hmm. uh, the, of the Education of Black People, and and he mentions specifically the vulgar exposition of liquor, extravagance, and fur coats. Right. <laughs> Whoa, that's kind of a a geo kind of thing, so to speak. Well, and not to, not to not that I do understand the significance of reconnecting that way. And it has certainly embraced all of those positive things. But I, it does bother me that somewhere about midway uh, during my tenure at a and uh, someone came to my mother and said, why you let your daughter go there? That's a party school. And I'm saying, what party? You know, mm. what, what, where are you getting that from? But a and had the reputation back in the early 70s, yeah. you know? So anyway, well, well, I, I, I just think it's something that as a university and a leading university, we can't afford to be defined by that. And some people unfortunately do. Well, one thing that you got to understand about W.E.B. Du Bois, if you haven't read a lot about him, is that he was approved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, du, du Bois was, I mean, Du Bois didn't like the fact that black folks shouted in church either. Right, that made him uncomfortable. I mean, Du Bois is from, from Massachusetts and, and, and not even Boston. I mean, he, he was cut from a Victorian cloth. Yeah, great uh, so there were a lot of things about black life that made him extremely uncomfortable, particularly as it related to the expression of black joy, whether that's via church or whether that's in school. Now I'll say this as well, Du Bois was not alone in those critiques, especially in the 1920s and 1930s. There were a number of other, even black college administrators who were saying, hey, these young black kids, we need y'all to, to all hands on deck. Y'all are doing too much of everything else. But what that really, I think, is more of a critique of was, was the pressures and dangers of living in black America in the 1920s and 1930s. We're talking about being in the midst of a nadir. Racial violence was exploding throughout this country. And, and what Du Bois 
and other black college administrators were, and not just black college administrators, but civil rights activists, many of whom themselves were connected to HBCUs. What they really were saying is that, hey, we need a movement. We're expecting a movement to come out of these institutions. Now, what I think that, that Du Bois and, and some of these other folks didn't really square up is how dangerous an overt movement in the Deep South would have been in the 1930s and 1940s, right? Uh, you know, so you look at the sit-ins, one of the reasons why the sit-ins as we celebrate them on February 1st was so radical and, and, and so um, uh, important uh, is that it, it, it created a dramatic confrontation with white supremacy, right? Black folks all their lives, young black folks all their lives have been told, don't you go in there and mess with them white folks, right? Don't you go in there and cause no trouble, right? But that's what black college students did on February the 1st, right? And as I often tell students when I lecture on this and talk about this, February 1st, we celebrate February 1st, it's really February the 2nd that's the most important day. Right, because if those four students come back to the yard and start telling other students about what they've done and that falls flat, right, then we don't get this energy, this movement that really moves forward. But February the 2nd, we get dozens of students showing up and then it spreads to North Carolina Central and to Wisconsin State and all these other institutions. So I say all that to say, you know, people were expecting a movement from young people when a movement, an overt movement that directly challenged white supremacy in the way in which the sit-ins do and did, uh, um, that could have cost someone their lives, right? And so, you know, there's this another quote in the book which talks about Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes came down to Alabama, right, during the... Um, uh, the Scottsboro boys case. So there are nine young, for those who might not be familiar with this case, there were nine young boys who were lynched or uh, who they were in, uh, in prison rather. Uh, they were threatened to be lynched because they said they had talked to, to white women. That proved to be false. But these young men are all in, uh, in jail um, and, and you know waiting a trial, right? Uh, so Langston Hughes comes down and he says, hey, you know, I went to the college to go talk to the students about this, and they acted like they didn't know, know anything about it. And he condemns, in fact, he wrote an article saying that the, 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 uh, the cowards from the college, right, was, so uh, that was the name of this article. But again, that loses context, right? There were, these were young Black folks he was trying to talk and rile up in a place like Alabama in the 1930s, where you could get, you could be killed, you could be lynched. Right, for speaking out uh, against the, the constructs of white supremacy. And so, you know, that space has, has been critically important for a number of years and it has um, uh, evolved and, and uh, developed over a number of years in a different way. And so, you know, I hear you in, in saying that, you know, maybe there's a lot of excess that goes into, into GHO and we only need to look at the words of, of Du Bois to really kind of confirm that, that critique. Um, but you know, as I said before, you got to know who, who that critique was coming from and how Du Bois was. And, and, and more importantly, I think we need to look at the long picture. And the long picture is the HBCUs have been a vital space for um, developing young Black leadership uh, and producing agents for, for social and political change. Well, my last comment on that is I went to school in the 70s also. Dr. Wooten taught me humanities. And he taught, uh, had us to read the souls of black folks alongside of the autobiography of Malcolm X. So bam, he gave us the balance. Right. That was clearly his effort to teach that second curriculum. Thank and, you. And, I, and I'll also say this, Faye, I'll also say this, Faye, before we move forward. Uh, every generation has been criticized for being party apps. They said the same thing about black kids who loved jazz in the 20s and 30s. They said the same thing about black kids who were who started wearing a, a mini skirts and, and whatnot in the, in the 60s and, 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 and 70s. And, and so every generation looks back on the upcoming generation. They find some form of criticism. I mean, look, I hate the hip hop that comes out today, but I love the hip hop from the 80s and 90s. But my mama hates. Right, <laughs> and she thought that we were going crazy. So every generation kind of looked back at, at, at past generations and, and found some form of criticism. And that, that's par for course. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Another question that came in the chat was from uh, Langston Clark. And uh, I just want to thank Langston for connecting us. He's on and I believe he has some students that are on as well. So Langston, um, can't thank you enough. You, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, yes, Tina, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and um, for just assisting with putting this together. I have a question, Dr. Favors, if I could ask. Um, you know, I'm an academic too. I work in higher education. I appreciate your story about 
being supported by PWIs as both of us have, having mm -hmm. gone to PWIs for graduate school, I'm wrestling with how white schools kind of take over the narrative of diversity and inclusion, especially in the midst of like all of these Black Lives Matter tragedies that happened over the summer, the coronavirus, and the radical me says, all that d &I money needs to go to black colleges first. Yeah. Because the white schools don't do a good job with it. Right. They get all this money, all these centers, they got three black people on campus. So I'm just wondering if you could talk to us about how, how do we leverage <clears throat> the history to uh, enact or promote policy that directs resources to our institutions so that they don't get wasted at institutions that really don't appreciate us? Well, th that falls on the leadership, you know? I mean, I, as I said before, I, I was on a call today uh, with uh, a group in California. And one of the things that I um, um, suggested and argued about HBCU life is that black lives have always mattered at HBCUs, always, right? Um, there, were, there were never attempts to discriminate against anyone at HBCUs in terms of who they let in that door, right? But it, it's black folks who, 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 who attended, uh, and that's something that we have to begin to wear with a badge of pride, right? You're right. There's always a lot of money associated with, with, with some of these events, especially as it relates to um, um, white liberalism, not even just white liberalism, but even sometimes white conservatism. I'm, sp I'm speaking at a, a program in Morehouse uh, in, um, at the end of February, and it's being sponsored by uh, the, th the Thousand Points of Light or the Points of Light Initiative. And if you remember, Points of Light, and it, that's Bush. That's Bush and his family. So the Bushes are sponsoring a program on black student activism being held at Morehouse. And, 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 and again, I think that's great that they are funneling that money through Morehouse, but it begs the question, you know, what's the expectation here, right? You know, in terms of, of, of the money that's being, being delivered and being sent out to these programs and to these institutions. So, you know, I think the HBCUs, you know, need to make that argument. I, I think that we need to become better stewards of our history. I think that we need to, you know, I, hate, I probably even shouldn't say this, but I think we need to promote books like Sheldon and Simon Stone, which shows our true history and our true legacy. As I said before, yes, the cultural pageantry is beautiful, but the most important, the most significant thing that we've ever done is transform and shape the political and social contours of this country. And so, hey, America, if you're worried about the current political state, Right. If you're worried about where we are and a resurgence of white supremacy, then it's probably best that you look at the institutions who've always done a great job in dealing with that and prescribe solutions for them. Right. And, and so part of that, again, is, is having a leadership that understands that that argument um, and, and, and understands the importance of that space. As I said before, I'm speaking also with the Prayer View a and in a couple of weeks, and you know, they've got this brand new, in fact, it hasn't even opened yet, but the Ruth Simmons Center for Racial and Social Justice. We need more centers like that on HBCU campuses. And so therefore, going back to your point, Langston, is that those centers can begin to make the argument that, hey, funnel that money through here because we're doing the work, right? Uh, and, and, and so we need more type of spaces and inst institutes like that that are developed. Um, one of the people I'm gonna be in conversation with at, at Morehouse uh, happens to be um, my, my good friend and my line brother, uh, uh, who I met in, in Columbus, Ohio when we were in grad school, Dr. Derek White, who has a great book, by the way, on Florida a and that came out uh, and, and the legacy of football at, at Florida a and uh, and Jake Gaither, but, but Derek and I, uh, are going to be in conversation together at Morehouse. And he wrote a great book called The Challenge of Blackness. If you haven't read that book, I encourage you to get that as well, because The Challenge of Blackness documents the creation of the Institute for the Black World, IBW. The IBW was a Black think tank that was created on the campuses of Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, and Spelman. In, in the wake of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination in 1968. But you have a black think tank emerging in the AUC now. The IBW ultimately ends up um, uh, uh, crumbling because of a lack of, 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 of support, financial support. But again, it begs the question, why is it that we don't have more IBWs? Why is it that we don't have more Ruth Simmons centers for race and social justice on these college campuses? And again, that takes visionary leadership to say, hey, it's great that we're welcoming and we're seeing an increase in, in enrollment, but we're also gonna provide a space for our students to, again, be reconnected to the second curriculum and understand their legacy and their role as cultural and social change agents moving forward. So it takes a very deliberate 
uh, uh, initiative, a very deliberate push uh, um, from Black college administrators to, to make that choice. And Ruth Simmons came to, to Prayer View from Brown and said, hey, I'm going to be very deliberate in the fact that we want a race and social justice center. I'm going to tap into all of my, my networks and bring funding in to make that happen. I have another question that kind of ties into funding. Given some of the recent unrestricted gifts to HBCUs, i.e. Mackenzie Scott, has Mr. Favors explored an initiative to work with these institutions to utilize some of these funds to pursue other grants to digitize, upgrade their archive, archival processes and preserve historical records? That's a great idea, no. Uh, but you, I'm, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not much, I'm not the grant writer. You know, I'm, I'm a scholar, I'm an academic and, and I'm off to pursue my next book. Uh, but I have indeed connected a number of HBCUs with um, outside third parties um, who are interested in providing um, funding and resources to them. Uh, uh, and so th that is indeed a part of what I've kind of, kind of been asked to do since the book came out. A lot of folks have been kind of hitting me up saying, hey, you know, you're the, the HBCU guy, right? You know, can you connect us to, to Morehouse? Can you connect us to, to a and And so, um, you know, let's make this really, really quick point about that funding though. And again, I think this kind of gets back to what Langston was pointing. We see all of these unrestricted gifts emerging, right? Millions of dollars being given and they're going towards scholarships. They're going towards, again, STEM funding, but again, none of them hardly are going to the humanities. None of them are going to social sciences. None of, none of them are going to actually um, um, strengthen the, the archives of these institutions. And again, I think that's sad. And I think that, um, I think that again, it's, it requires a visionary leadership to understand that these are holes, these are problems that exist on these college campuses and they deserve to be funded in the same way in which the STEM fields and the business fields and the other fields are also being funded. Again, this is not to denigrate STEM or business or even or certainly not denigrate the fact that we need um, scholarship money, but we also need to be able to funnel some of those uh, uh, resources and some of those gifts into supporting the archives and the humanities and the social sciences on these campuses. Um, uh, uh, one, one other question that came up, um, acknowledging the role of, that HBCUs play in civil rights, how do you compare that to the role of HBCUs in Black Lives Matters? Do you think the role has changed or the same, or do you feel any institutions are fulfilling this role? It's definitely changed. Um, you know, HBCUs were the epicenter of the direct action protest. They were the, they were the epicenter of, of student activism emerging um, during this period. And not only that, but it really lifted the civil rights movement into, a, uh, into an area which it had not been lifted before. Um, you know, when the sit-ins first took place, you know, the NAACP didn't support it. You know, the NAACP favored um, uh, litigation. You know, they didn't want to get involved in the messy affairs of, of having a direct confrontation with white supremacy. Um, when the sit-ins first took place, Dr. King was nervous, was scared about joining students uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the downtown Crest stores in, in Atlanta. Um, his daddy didn't want him to do it at all. Uh, you know, so, uh, so black colleges um, during the 1960s in, in particular, really served as an epicenter for, and create, created the energy um, that emerged out of this. I think what we're seeing now, and again, this is no critique against Black Lives Matter or, 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 or any of the, the movements that are emerging here, but again, a lot of it's being fueled by social media, um, which is a good thing. I mean, in terms of communication and networking, people can get their messages out there very quickly, and that's a good, that can be a good thing, but I think it's a double, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It can also be a bad thing uh, as well in terms of being able to control that message and harness that message and channel that message into to the type of activism that's going to be necessary. Activism that not just, uh, again, takes on, a, 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 on, on cops in the streets, but also uh, creates policies right that, that, that can ultimately help us solve solve some of these uh, dilemmas and problems and issues which are, are not new which have been in existence um, for a number of years and so um, you know again moving forward I, I would love to see HBCUs become more forthright and more open about um, um, 
bringing in students in an effort to directly channel them into uh, the type of transformation and change that we need to see coming out of these institutions as it relates to, again, cultural change agents. In other words, anti, it'd be great if anti can get a center for, for race and social justice and, and create an internship program and, and, and put our students, connect our students with po local policymakers and create relationships and networks with people within the community uh, um, to develop that. You know, we live here in Atlanta and I've said this before to a number of my Morehouse friends and, and, and Spelman sisters as well. You know, there should be no reason why uh, um, Southwest Atlanta looks that way, the way that it does around Morehouse and Spelman. Why is it that is it that uh, uh, um, those institutions have not prescribed solutions to the economic and political problems of those communities? So HBC, HBCUs have to be more forthright and intentional uh, in, in promoting policy and promoting um, and creating students who are going to, to lead that, that policy charge um, to help solve some of these issues. And I think that we've seen some, some fall off from that. And again, this is something which I talk about in the last chapter of my book, um, which talks about the corruption of that, of that community, that space. Thank you. That, that um, basically ties to a question that was asked with regards to being intentional. What can we do to help HBCUs leverage this moment in a time to be more intentional in support of HBCUs? One of the challenges we have here in Atlanta as the alumni chapter is participation um, in the chapter and you know, getting people to, to give back to the university. So I don't know if there's a, an answer, but we'd like to hear what you have to say. I don't know. You know, I mean, like all of you, uh, you know, I, I witnessed the, the restructuring of the alumni association that they had uh, about, a, I guess, a few months back now. They decided to, to restructure and transform and change how they do things. I don't know if that was done in an effort to say, look, we need to do a better job in reconnecting with some of the local chapters. I also don't know how many of you feel about, about that move. I think what is clearly evident, however, um, is that, again, you know, we see HBC graduates you know, loving to rock their colors, you know, loving to say Aggie pride, but when it comes to cutting the check uh, and it comes to supporting our, our black colleges at the local chapter alumni level, we often struggle with that. You know, I applaud ANTI and the, I think they have the, the young North Carolina ANTI Alumni Association. I think they're launching a, a, a young alumni give back campaign uh, in the next couple of days, I think. I'm sure someone can confirm that. Um, but that's the type of efforts that we need, right? Uh, as we used to say when I, when I worked at Morgan State, you know, we need to make sure the students hear that message when on, on first day, right? We need to drill that in their minds as freshmen, the act of giving back and, and the importance of that. Uh, and we also need to put in their hands books like Shelter in the Time of Storm, right? So they can understand why these institutions are so vitally important, right? Why they deserve to be preserved and more importantly, what they have to do with the freedom dreams of black folks, right? You know, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but uh, I know I've said this in a number of different talks. I talked about Dr. William Nelson Jr. Uh, who was my professor at Ohio State University, one of my, my first mentors at Ohio State University. And in his class, you know, Dr. Nelson used to always look like he was about to fall asleep on you. He used to always look like he wasn't really paying attention. But then Dr. Nelson would spring to life and he would ask us this, this singular question. Whatever it was that we were talking about, he would say, what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? In fact, I talked about that in my speech that I gave for, for convocation uh, in the fall. What does this have to do with the liberation of black people? And when we, when we began to ask that question and then answer that question as it relates to the legacy of HBCUs, they will understand the vital importance of continuing to fund them uh, and support them as alumni moving forward. In other words, HBCUs have everything to do with the liberation of black people. And it is essential that we play a critical role in continuing to support them uh, moving forward. And if I can jump in for young alumni, that goes for, for, for folks who are, who, who are old Aggies as well. If I can jump in for a second, just to kind of emphasize how dire it is, the only 10 HBCUs have alumni given over 15%, right. and only four of those have alumni given over 30%. And I think Claflin is at about 50%, which is amazing. But, you know, like you said, you know, Aggie Pride, Eagle Pride, we talk, you know, I saw Wayne Sellers on, uh, on the call, and Wayne and I go back and forth on a couple of uh, Facebook pages talking about Central and A&T. But we got to, you know, it's, it, it takes more than just talking about it. We got to open up our wallets and, and kind of give that money as well. And, and you know what, I want to connect that comment with what Faye said earlier. 
you know, we'll spend two hundred dollars on a singular uh, 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 tailgating space, you know, mm-hmm. but but then frown at the idea of giving two hundred dollars to our institution. Right? Yeah. And I've seen that even in my own uh, um, crew at times that, you know, people, you know, we, we always get hyped about supporting um, uh, or not supporting, but coming to GHO and we get our gear and we, we get, you know, dressed to the nines and we get our outfits together and we, you know, we got the, 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 the tailgate laid with food. But when it comes to actually saying, hey, I'm going to write a check just to support a to support my alma mater, to support the department from which I emerged, you know, folks begin to get tight lipped. And, and again, I think that's a cultural issue. I think that's a systemic issue that, again, we have to be able to address that and to, to solve that. Uh, the moment the students step on that campus, they need, to be, they need to begin to understand the legacy of these institutions and what they've done in, 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 in uh, uh, serving as a springboard uh, for the freedom dreams of Black folks across this country from 1837 to 2021. And I think that when, when they begin to embrace that message, uh, perhaps we'll see a new generation emerging um, that understands that, hey, we have to preserve these, these institutions and we have to financially support these institutions. As I said before, we can't count and wait on the state to do what's right. We can't count and wait on the federal government to do what's right and to correct past wrongs. We have to be um, the primary uh, uh, promoters and supporters of the colleges that we say that we love. Another question. One more. I think we have we have one more question. It's about it's eight fifty nine, but we'll do one more question and, and Cheryl, we'll have you uh, close us out. Okay. Uh, wow. The another question was: Does the second curriculum still exist today? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> you know, again, when, I, when we think about race consciousness, we think about cultural nationalism, we think about idealism. Um, these are beautiful concepts. You know, you know I mentioned this in the book um, and in the introduction of James Weldon Johnson arriving on campus at Morehouse when he was a student at Morehouse. James Weldon Johnson, of course, went on to become one of the, the, the major founders of the NAACP, but he said, look, when I was in Morehouse, everything we talked about was about race. It centered around race, right? It was the subject of essays. It was the subject of, of debates that we would have in our, in, in, our, in our classrooms as well as in our dorm rooms. Um, there was an energy, and that's what the set curriculum is. It's not the, it's an energy that flows through that space that's connected to the freedom dreams of black people. Uh, and you know, I dare say, you know, when I was in Morgan State, I, I could feel that energy. Um, you know, I would always say that, you know, sometimes you are very discouraged as an educator, as a teacher, but when I opened up that door to my classroom, every day I saw the future of Black America. And some days I was very uh, enthusiastic about what I saw. Some days I was concerned, right? Uh, but but it, it still allowed me an opportunity to, to as, as one of my graduate professors said when he was reading my dissertation, he said, you know, it sounds like, and you know, this is Dr. Hassan Jeffries who went to Morehouse, uh, and Dr. Hassan Jeffries, by the way, his brother is Hakeem Jeffries, who's the, the uh, uh, congressman from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but, but Hassan said to me, he said, you know, it kind of sounds like a church where you have a laying, hand, laying on a hands moment, right? Where an old church mother just comes up to you and prophetically just want to lay hands on you and wish the best for you and push you in the right direction. This is, sounds kind of like what you're describing here. And that's what HBCUs have, have really kind of served, a space where we can lay hands on the next generation. Right? And we can either mold them and shape them in that second curriculum, right? or we can fall back to the, to, to the, uh, to the corrupt nature of hyper-capitalism and, and corporatism and, and all the other things which have become dominant on many of these campuses. This is not just an HBCU thing. This is an a, a issue in higher education, right? uh, of how higher education has really kind of served as a platform and as a space to advance corporate America. And what does that do to, again, addressing systemic poverty? What does it do to addressing systemic racism, right? What type of solutions does that prescribe? And, and so I think HBCUs have to be very careful in this moment um, that we simply aren't replicating and identifying ourselves as an alternative to Harvard, as an alternative to the University of Michigan, as an alternative to Ohio State. We have to understand that again, creating and crafting freedom dreams, which speak to the deconstruction of white supremacy, the creation of a more just and tolerant society is is a a strong part, a major part of the legacy of these colleges. 
And whether you uh, attended a t in the 1970s or the 1980s, or whether you're arriving on campus as a new freshman in 2021, you need to understand your role within that. And the set curriculum is a large part of that. And so I hope that moving forward, students will embrace that. In fact, as I said before, you know, um, uh, it should be coming out hopefully in the next couple of weeks or maybe even months uh, of an institution adopting um, Shelter in the Time of Storm as the first year reader for its students. And the person who made that decision said, this is why we want to do that, is that we want to make sure our students understand that part of the legacy. We want them to think of themselves as the next part of that generation. We don't simply want to be known as an institution that has a, a large band and, and one of the most successful HBCUs. Right? We want to be known as a space um, where we're connected, uh, intricately connected, directly connected to the struggles and concerns of Black people in this country. And that's the story and the narrative that I've tried to tell in this book. And I hope that moving forward, that's going to be the story and narrative that Black colleges uh, embrace as part of their future. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just say one thing. Um, sorry about that. Just, you know, when you talk about the heritage and education, uh, for those Aggies that are on, if you have not read the book, pay close attention to chapter seven, which talks about a and but there were so many organizations that were started at the university, and it was a community um, activism in Greensboro, Dudley High School, um, that they really supported not just the education at the college level, but they looked at poverty and housing and everything else. And so um, it was just eye opening for, for me, not coming from Greensboro, to just have that history of what actually went on there and to see those organizations that were actually formed on our campus. And then to think today of what's going on with our government and the insurrection and, and what the students had to go through back then. Um, just for equal rights. And, and you know, so there's a there's definitely this is this book is extremely timely um, and a parallel to what we're living today. So, you know, if you have not gotten the book, please get the book. We put the um, link in the chat. Um, it's great for for us who have graduated from an HBCU. It's great for students that are going to an HBCU that want to know the history. So um, I want to just thank you, Jelani, and thank you, Ernie. And um, Cheryl, did you have one more one more question before we sign off? I did. It's, it's, it was a few more, but uh, a couple more. But I, I really wanted to get this young lady's question answered because she is um, transitioning. And I'm just going to read her. Her name is Ramey Davis. And her she made a statement. She said, first, this is something I truly need. This is an affirmation for me. I'm a senior currently at UTSA. Shout out to Dr. Langston Clark for this. I'm currently applying to Alabama State University for grad school. I truly feel like I belong at an HBCU. It's very overwhelming at the moment. What is some advice on moving to a different atmosphere? Well, um, you know, ironically, I have a, a student um, who, I know by way of another um, professor in Mississippi, uh, she's a graduate of Tougaloo and she's gonna be headed to Ohio State. Um, so I can tell you what I, I told her today in an email as she gets ready to attend my, my graduate alma mater. Um, you know, first of all, um, connect with mentors, right? Connect with mentors and, and you're gonna find a bunch of them at Alabama State. That's one of the things that HBCUs probably do best is that, you know, you're, if, you know, I had a, a, a little brother who I met when I was in grad school at Ohio State, and he wasn't really my brother, but I kind of adopted him under my wing, and he ended up wanting to go to, guess what, a and uh, And so he went off to a and and I told him when I dropped him off, I said, look, I'm dropping you off in a space where um, um, there are going to be people who want to invest in you, right, who, who, who want to be intentional and deliberate in investing in you as a person. Allow them to do that. Right? Allow them to, to help you and to assist you. So um, be very direct. Uh, a closed mouth doesn't get fed. Um, make sure that you go up and introduce yourself to, to, to the uh, administrators and to the, uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, faculty members within your department. Uh, let them know your interest. And I said before, watch them work. Sit back and, and watch them work because they will invest in you. As I said before, I went to grad school at Ohio State and Dr. William Nelson Jr. 
made grad school possible for me. When I say my, when I say he made possible, made it possible for me, he made sure I got funding to get into Ohio State so I didn't have to pay out of my pocket. But he was a graduate of an HBCU. Right. And he, he, he was a legacy. He was an extension of that legacy. And so when you arrive at uh, uh, Alabama State, um, just tap into the folks who are around you, ask them what, what it is that you need to do to be successful, to make that transition to becoming uh, a graduate student. Uh, I'm not sure if you shared your discipline and what it is that you're going to be majoring in. Um, um, but just find the type of mentorship that you need on that campus. And it, it will abound. As I said before, that's one of the things that HBCUs have, have done the best, and that is um, providing a space uh, uh, and creating a space where um, there are a lot of folks there who are going to want to invest in you to make sure that you're the best that you could possibly be. And I'm sure there are tons of other people on here who will give you a lot of other advice, including Dr. Clark himself. So please make sure that you connect with Dr. Clark, because I'm sure you already have, and, and listen to the advice that, that he has to give, because he's an Aggie, he's an HBCU alum, and I'm sure that he's already sold so much into your life. Um, but you know, do trust that he's not going to send you off unprepared, right? And that's one thing I could say about the faculty who mentored me at a and I knew that when I arrived at Ohio State that I was going to be able to compete, that I was fully prepared, that I was ready um, because I had faculty and as I said before, people who believed in me at a time when I didn't believe in myself and that made all the difference um, for me. And I, as I said before, I'm sure Dr. Clark has hopefully been that for you and he's sending you off to Alabama State um, fully prepared and fully ready to, to make the transition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to make that the last question because she's, you know, she's here and, and she needs her mind molded and she sees strong people here from HBCUs and especially you three men who um, were here this evening. We thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. We didn't think it was going to be too out. Sure, sure. Can, I ask, can I ask what she's majoring in? If Langston could share that or is she sharing that? Like, what is she going to Alabama State for? Um. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I'm currently like in the library, but um, I'm going into clinical mental health counseling. In what now? Clinical mental health counseling. Oh, clinical mental health. Oh, that's an excellent field. Mm -hmm. Gosh, do we need that right now? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. and so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do like a. Uh, 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 like like my, my, my mentors and my faculty would say, is anybody here work in that area, <laughs> right? Can we help this sister? Can, can we get her connected to some resources? Uh, as I said before, you know, when you get to Alabama State, make sure you talk to the folks that you're gonna be studying with, but I'm sure there are other people who, who study that and can help you. And, and I'm sure, as I said before, Dr. Clark has been a, 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 an extreme help to you as well moving forward, but um, you know, Alabama State's a good school. And I encourage you to, to if, if you get a chance to get the book and read that chapter on Alabama State. It's, it's a long, long legacy of black activism and, and, and uh, intentional and deliberate efforts to mold and shape young black folks who are connected to those freedom dreams. So you're going to a great school. And, and the only thing I can say is I wish you were going to a and <laughs> <laughs> No, sure. thank you so much for this. This is like really a true inspiration because coming from this, going to a PWI to an HPC was something that I truly wanted to do. And it just brought tears to my eyes just getting this affirmation. So thank you again, Dr. Clark. This was really something that I truly needed. Awesome. I'm glad it's been great for you, sister. I appreciate it. We're, we're pulling off, we're pulling for you uh, as you make your way to Alabama State. Aggie pride anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again. And we, on that note, we're going to go ahead and end. And uh, we do have a few questions. I can uh, get them over to Tina to get them to you and possibly you can answer them and um, we can get those questions answered to those respective people. All right. Thanks, everyone. Well, it's been great. I really appreciate uh, being invited to uh, spend the evening with the Aggies. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. It's always great touching mics with you, and I appreciate it. Yep, we got to do it again. Absolutely, man. Now, one thing, I'm about to watch Central's playing South Carolina State in basketball. I want all of y'all to watch this to understand what we're going to do to you guys later on. <laughs> okay, so before we go, only Aggies, you can um, open your mic. We have to get an Aggie pride in. One, two, three. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you